I'll tell you what, I, I, uh, I couldn't, ag I couldn't agree more. <laughs> that takes a lot of guts. Hey, out there. <laughs> That was for the people watching the show at home with their 3D glasses. Hi there. <laughs> now, let me explain, if you don't know what I'm talking about. Out here in Los Angeles, over the weekend, one of the local stations, what was it, Channel? Channel 9, I believe, had a 3D movie. Now, how many of you remember 3D movies, first of all? <laughs> I think. Well, and some of the stores in town here sold, sold two million pairs of glasses at 99 cents a pop. And what the glasses are, <laughs> what a ripoff. <laughs> I still have mine from Juana Duffel. Remember that? <laughs> Little piece of blue cellophane on one side and red cellophane on the other, and you have to hold them like this because they won't hang on your ear. <laughs> they sold two million pair of those at 99 cents. And then on Channel 9, they showed a, uh, a Vincent Price movie hosted by a local personality, kind of a stunning looking girl. <laughs> called Elvira, yeah. who was also in 3D, and it was, it was <laughs> very effective, because I went to turn the knob on my TV set. <laughs> and Elvira gave me a shot in the chops, right? <laughs> So for the you folks around the rest of the country, it'll give you an idea of the excitement out here in Los Angeles. The entire town sitting around watching a 1954 Vincent Price movie with cardboard glasses. Now, there's another big one scheduled for this weekend, Saturday in 3D, Richard Denning and Mamie Van Doren in the strange organs of Dr. Zarloff. <laughs> That's all they did during the movie. They wanted to give you the idea, so every time they went like this. Well, did you see the movie, Tom? I saw Born the Devil. Born the Devil. <laughs> who was in it? I bet you can't remember who was in it. Wasn't Robert Stack in Born? Bob Stack yeah. was in Born the Devil? The worst movie in the world. Well, <laughs> it was not a biggie, anyway. Tommy Newsom is filling in for Doc, and uh, Mr. Excitement, he is he... <laughs> Tommy Newsom once wrote a letter to Ann Landers and asked her if, his, if Ovaltine was an aphrodisiac. <laughs> to give you an idea. <laughs> How many of you know that there was an earthquake in Los Angeles this morning? Yeah. Measured 4.1 on the Richter scale, but 8.3 on the Fechner scale. <laughs> That's by our own doctor out here in Burbank, Dr. Leopold Fechner. Uh, it was 8-3 on his scale, and that's the, that's the number of shots of straight vodka Dr. Fechner took after the quake to settle himself down. He, there were some casualties. Three couples are missing, presumed lost in a hot tub uh, here in the valley. Did you, did you feel the quake? Yes, sir. It was bad where I live. In front of my house this morning, a Japanese tourist was knocked out when all seven of his cameras at once hit him in the head. <laughs> this is kind of a, uh, a proud day in Southern California, our Nobel Prize sperm bank. <laughs> Are you familiar with that? Very controversial, where uh, anonymous donors of very high IQs donate sperm and the idea of producing very intelligent offspring. And the first baby was born today in Southern California by, I guess, what, a, a genius donor. And uh, was a healthy baby girl. And it was easy to pick out this Nobel Prize baby, because as you went by the maternity window, when you look in, she had just solved Rubik's Cube. <laughs> But even in the delivery room, you could tell she was going to be a smart kid. In the womb, she listened to the news and refused to come out. <laughs> oh. I just had a funny thought. I wonder where Pia Zadora's husband goes when he wants a home-cooked meal. <laughs> just a... 
Just a silly thought. Uh, there is a late report in the newsroom. Sophia Loren just escaped from jail. Disguised as two boys. <laughs> Poor Sophia has been in, in, as you know, she's in jail in Italy. Been there about a week, had a 30-day sentence, and according to the papers today, she is suffering from insomnia, depression, very, in a deep funk, and uh, the warden is worried today he took away her belt and her spaghetti. <laughs> no occasions. <laughs> How many of you are aware that the President of the United States is in Los Angeles? Yes. yes. Air Force One carrying uh, President Reagan and Nancy Reagan landed at uh, Los Angeles International Airport, and it was, a, it was really a thrilling sight. There were thousands of people rushed up to the plane, all holding brand of tickets, uh, <laughs> trying to see if... They're all trying to hitch a free ride to Santa Barbara, you know. <laughs> Reagan likes it. He goes up the ranch and he uh, chops brush and clears wood. Is there clears brush and chops wood? I've never... Yeah. It does both. He <laughs> clears and chops and... Uh... <laughs> no, he goes to the ranch where the deer and the antelope play. Never has heard a discouraging word. And Tip O'Neill is not seen all day. It's kind of a... <laughs> Some exciting show business news. Guess who's getting married? Marie Osmond is getting married. Yeah? Well, I think what it is, she got tired of drinking all that Hawaiian punch and she's looking for new thrills. <laughs> it's gonna be an intimate wedding. Only the immediate family will be there. <laughs> they rented the L.A. Coliseum. <laughs> anyway, we have... You're in a good mood. We got a great show for you tonight. We have the lovely Suzanne Plachette with us. Very funny uh, young comedian, Argus Hamilton, is here. And two gentlemen. And two gentlemen. This could be a fascinating spot. They were the chief animators at Disney Studios for many, many years. Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson are here. And we're going to talk about how they do all those wonderful things. Um, and I guess that's about it. That's it. And I think you sent some questions down. Thank you for coming. We'll be with you in just a <laughs> talk about this later, but uh, so stay with us because this is a, one of the most fascinating books I've ever read called mm. Disney Animation, The Illusion of Life. And the two gentlemen who were the chief uh, animators there are going to be here later and show you some of their technique. We have a little film clip because, you know, it was great. A, oh, sure. it, is, it is great art. Mm -hmm. Great art. We handed some questions out tonight. We dared do that with this group? <laughs> we dared did it. Mm. Uh, I probably will mispronounce this name. Ruth Molyneux. Was that right, Ruth? Molino, Molino. Oh, no. That's a uh, French Canadian, right? Yes. Molino. I used to. Was, I was in the service by a, with a fellow by the name of Manu Arsenault. He was he was French French Cajun from Louisiana. Was his name? Uh, she says, "Have you ever gotten up in the morning at 5 a.m. to stand in line for a show?" <laughs> Did you do that, Ruth? Yes. Well, bless your heart. That's very sweet of you. Well, it's, it's free, but, I, you know, anyway, that's standing in line. I, it was in the Navy. I stood in line for... to see a show. It was a training film. Oh, really? Remember those? Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Something like, ointment is your pal. <laughs> Mac, uh, Mark... Antoniti? Antoniti. Like the disease. <laughs> Which is the better commissary, New York or Burbank? Actually, that's uh, yeah, that's a tough one. Probably the Calcutta commissary. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. We used to 
We, do, we don't eat too much in either no, one of them. No, no. We had a contest years ago in New York to name the New York commissary, and I think the winner was called Cramped Tomb. <laughs> somebody, somebody came up with Karen Masio from Boca Raton. Where are you, Karen? Muccio. Excuse me? Muccio, I'm sorry. Uh, how many six-packs can Ed drink in one hour? <laughs> Let me ask you this, Karen. Uh, you ever seen Pac-Man in action? <laughs> yeah. That's close enough, yeah. Uh... Sharon Dooling from Marlton, New Jersey. Sharon? Stephen. Oh, Stephen. Stephen, I'm sorry, oh, Stephen. I beg, beg your pardon, sir. <clears throat> yes. Why can't you use the restrooms during your show? <laughs> Is that, is that something that's on the ticket? People cannot use the restrooms? We don't have a restroom. <laughs> we, were you informed that you couldn't? I didn't know that. I don't know, maybe... I guess since we can't go, they can't go. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> something like that. But they'll find out... I think the fear is... I think the fear is you'll find out that's more interesting in there and won't come back. I don't know. Anyway, uh, take a porta potty to that gentleman over there. Uh, how long, on the average, asked Nancy Simpson, do members of the band stay with your show? Wait, well, just look at them. They're not with me now. <laughs> no. I mean, most of the guys have been on the show since we came to California, right? Until yep. they learn to read. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy's been Tommy, here 20 years. Tommy has been with the show for, what, 20 years? Right, Tom? Yes, I have. Yeah, he's the longest mm -hmm. running resident here. I can't read this. If, if NBC were an airline, would it most closely resemble A. Braniff, B. Pan Am, C. Golden West? <laughs> <laughs> the Hindenburg, I think. I don't know. No. No. NBC is coming back. They're coming back. Strong. NBC is coming back, I'll tell you. At the studio tour, we were told you were basically a shy personality. This says Pete Falter. Where are you, Pete? Did they, is that what they told you? Yes, sir. Well, I think I am. Don't mm -hmm. you, you say are that? Sure, yes. Yeah. How can you project such great charisma on oh. TV? Oh. God, son of a. Actually, the way I do that, this is really a giant Valium. <laughs> During the show, when you see me come down here, I, well, that's very nice of you. Basically, I'm sure, no, when I'm performing, it's, it's one thing. Mm. I get in a, you've seen me at parties, sure. I go sit in the corner of the room, and I don't yeah. know why. You're a missy, he's a mixer. This guy goes to a party, hey, good to see you. <laughs> Ed McMahon, got, got the badge and the, put a Shriner's hat on him and a badge, and this, hey, good to see ya. I sit in the corner, and like, you know, like people, I'm paranoid, I guess. Uh, how far do you have to drive to work, asked Bob Olmsted. Yo, ask it. He pulls the rickshaw. Uh, <laughs> takes me uh, takes me about 24, 25 minutes to get to work. Mm -hmm. I like to drive in California. It's uh, very easy driving on here. <laughs> just just do not miss your turnoff. <laughs> if you go down to downtown L.A. and you miss Ooh. the Civic Center turnoff or Flower Street, you are in Ensenada, Mexico. <laughs> Automatically, right. there's no way to get back on. And Kevin Gabriel? Where are you, Kevin? Yeah. We could use some refreshments. And it's outside while waiting. Well, now that's... Can't you set a dish of Alpo or something out there? <laughs> uh, that would bust us. I would not. Where would you like to live if or when you retire? Just wanted to know if I have any chance of being your next door neighbor and growing old with you. <laughs> Says Joan Garwood. Where are you, Joan? Right here. Oh. Mm. <laughs> well, I, I don't know about growing old with me, no. but you. You, ha you have a good shot about 15 minutes behind the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's silly. That's just. <laughs> Pure silliness. It's just a joke. Just a joke. Uh, 
I have a song I'd like to sing. I bet I can stump the band. Says Diane. Seifert? Seifert? Where are you, Diane? <laughs> oh, I can see why you're being rather reticent. <laughs> the song is called I'd Love the Wiener Man. <laughs> I don't think we want to take that kind of a chance. No. <laughs> if our roles were reversed, would you stand in line two and a half hours to see me? <laughs> says. Yeah. Says. And that's sign Art Borman. Where are you, Art? Hey, you betcha I'd stand in line. The Art Borman show, you sure. betcha. <laughs> uh. Who is older, you or Ed? I'm older. Yeah. Yep. Not much. <laughs> Two years. Two years is all. What is... <laughs> obviously, obviously a note of disbelief from That's the right. audience there. I just bring my look, birth certificate does, in. Why, are you saying that I look older than Ed? No. No, just, uh, I'll just shine over here and in your hair. What? I don't know, I missed that. <laughs> what do you think? Oh, I'm cuter than you are. Oh, no question about that. Yeah. What is really in your coffee cup? Uh, Robert Young's teeth are in there, do you think? <laughs> do you think? Okay. Okay, we don't... We, thank you very much for the question. We don't have time. We've got to move along here. Is this new sponsor? New one, yes. A new one. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Here we are. We would like to welcome to The Tonight Show a new product from Jovan, Dialatan. Watch. <laughs> All right. Yeah! Hot group for Tuesday. Here's a very dear lady, a good friend of mine, and a lovely, talented actress. Would you welcome Miss Suzanne Plachette? Don't you want to get a lousy weight, huh? What? <laughs> no food, no toilet facilities. I always strap a baggie on my. Do leg. you? Yeah. yeah the Except when are... I'm doing features, I never go to the bathroom when I do features. <laughs> people are very nice. They do stand in line out yes. here, and you look very, both of you, Thank you. extremely Thank you. dignified tonight. Really? Yes, a little blazer. Blue, blue, yeah. Yes. You know, I see you more often than you think I do. I find myself. <laughs> It's not with the binoculars. No, no, none of no, not for 3D. <laughs> if so, where's my mole? I watch you. <laughs> um, no, I don't know that. I when I'm up in my office before we start taping the show, before the news comes on, the reruns oh, of the Bob Newhart yes. show are on, and the episodes I haven't caught, and I realize how really wonderful you were on that oh, show with Bob oh, and that whole cast of people. Thank you. It's really, really good stuff. Well, I didn't get a chance to see a lot of them. There are... You make it look very easy and just, uh, you know... It so, was. It was a, an extraordinary company. Bob's really. going to do another show here. I know, I yes. hope so. He's a funny man. He is. It's going to be on on Monday nights on yeah. CBS. Yeah. On, as and they say, I'm another network. For... Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> do you know it's nice? We used to have a reunion once a month. We'd all get together for lunch and... Oh, after the one show? Would... One? Yeah. That's and nice. we were at La Scala Boutique one day, and all of us, and Ginny, Bob's wife, was there, and people walking in said, my, my God, they... They look, they really talk to each other. You know, they were so stunned to see us really in a social situation. It's very true that very often you, you make movies and, and television, and very often after a picture breaks up, the company does not see each other. Yeah. And everybody thinks that everybody in the entertainment business is, are intimate, close friends, and they're not very often. So it's nice that after a show finishes. Yeah. When we go off the air, Ed, whenever that is. Uh, <laughs> Never. Have, Once a month, we'll meet. Have we'll meet somewhere. Yeah. I've I'll, been I'll with send you. a guest host. <laughs> 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 I've been with you since this show, since you've been with this show. Do you realize your first year, I won the Photoplay Award as the most promising newcomer. <laughs> God knows I didn't live up to that. <laughs> oh, come on. Yes. Was, and was I that did with, your show in Philadelphia. That's right. Was that with sure. Hedda Hopper? Hedda Hopper. Hedda Hopper used to come yes. on the show. Do you I I want to tell you, during, I, I was very, I happened to be funny because I wasn't I smart enough to I want to see how old or young our audience is tonight. Oh. How many remember Hedda Hopper? Just applaud if you do. Okay, how many, how many don't know who I'm talking about? 
Well, I was a child star. <laughs> no, I didn't do that to me. Make... I'll get you later. <laughs> and do I have the information? I didn't know. <laughs> but anyhow, during that show... Right. I mean, I really hadn't met you before. And I, I was telling a story that was very funny, which I wish I could remember, because I tell it again tonight. And Hedda Hopper kept doing this. And she was hurting me, but I didn't realize she was doing this because as the hand came in on my arm, they had to cut to a two-shot. So during the break, I said to her, you know, you're a very nice lady, but if you hit me again, I'm going to knock you on your can. <laughs> and you got hysterical. Oh, yeah. That endeared yourself Absolutely to her right hysterical. away. Absolutely hysterical. And she, I mean, she had two ways to go, either destroy me right. or to become my friend for life. And she did. And she she did. was actually very kind oh. to me. Yes, you're a nice lady. Yeah, nice lady. I liked her. The last time you were here, yes. you were headed back to Broadway oh, to, God, yes. to, as they say, appear on the boards, to uh, back to your craft. I said goodbye craft. to you for a year. I was going back for my art. And if I ever tell you I want to do something for my art again, make me buy a painting. Now, in case they don't know, she, uh, Suzanne went back to New York to appear in a play um, written by a, a good writer. A wonder, I still think a wonderful play, and I will come to your home and read it <laughs> to you, because you'll never get to see it. And you received absolutely fantastic reviews personally, and it was just one of those things where the play didn't work. Anymore. Well, I, John, it opened and closed in the same night. Well, that's, I guess that's not working. Yeah. Uh, Let me put it this way. In the middle of the first how did you act... Know? How did you know you were in trouble? Well, possibly when they were booing and hissing. And oh, come on. No, no. I don't know. We had done 26 previews, and the audiences in New York, right. they never went out of town. The audiences had been wonderful. You know, preview audiences have not yet been told whether it's a hit or a miss, so they're not always sure whether they should laugh. The critics have not reviewed it then. No, no, no. I see. You do tw uh, they can only come two days before the official opening. Right. And in fact, the critics no longer come on opening night, which is wonderful, because opening night is usually not what the play is about. The audience is there for other reasons. Right. And uh, the, during the previews, we had no idea. We thought it was working. And then in the middle of the first act, when the curtain came down the first act, I turned to the stage manager mm -hmm. and the other actor. There were only two of us in this play. And I said, we're in deep trouble. Really? And I said, it's not a good audience, but they're not here. Right. You know, they're here to see each other's dresses or because they invested or they read the play or they're right. nervous for us. Right. And I said, I think we better do it for us because it may be the last chance. And it turned out to be true. Uh, we opened and closed on that one Sunday. And all the months... Oh, and you know, it's tragic go into that. I mean, people build sets, you break your, your buns for this thing, and you go out, and I must say, I still think it's a wonderful play. And right. I, when people ask me what went wrong, I give the most honest answer yeah. I can. I don't know. Mm. I wasn't in the audience. You don't. I never right. saw it. You know, you point out something interesting, though, and it shows you the problems. Because television, you know, gets zipped all the time mm -hmm. and zapped by the critics for not doing quality stuff. And television is required every week. That's right. To come up with a new, fresh, exciting show. And this shows you the problems. Here's a play, or in any play, not just you. You can have the best writers, the best performers, actors. They go out, they, they're on the road for three months, so they go to Philadelphia, they work on it, they come into New York and close in one night. Yeah. And yet television, in a way, is expected. Every you know, night you do a show. To do okay. every night or, or every week. week to do a brand new show. Yeah. And it's, that's just tough to do. During a, a preview... Uh, we had made a cut in a 20-minute scene, and they had cut right. like nine minutes out. And you have 20 minutes in the afternoon, you reverse it. And I'm out there, and you know, you, the actor's nightmare, I'll forget my lines, I'll forget this, I won't move in the right place. And I look at Richard Mulligan, and I suddenly don't know where I am. I'd had 20 minutes in the afternoon to rehearse it. I mean, I'm in the wrong clothes, in the wrong place in the set, and he tries to help me, and he can't. And I finally turned to the audience, I said, Ladies and gentlemen, I am in deep trouble. And I strode to the wings and I said, Warren, what's the next line? And he gave it to me. I came back and I said, shall we start again? And we went right back into it. And they were wonderful. I mean, they well, screamed, right. they cheered us on, they knew we were in trouble. There's nothing wrong with saying that when no, you're in trouble. No, I mean, I think it's when you know that, you know, what's going on, you're, you're very helpful and that was the truth of it. It takes a certain amount of courage to do that, is to walk I was and never say. scared again. Yeah. I was, because what else could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, you don't know where you are. That's right. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Here. <laughs> we do. Oh, that's right. Thank you, Tom. Terrific. I think well. Terrific. Would you miss most about being in New York? Did you get homesick? Well... I got more than homesick. Yeah. I really wanted to come back. Yeah. 
uh, about the first week into rehearsal, I came home sobbing and asked Tommy to buy me out of the play. I missed everybody here. So, you know, New York is my home. I know. You and I had this there. whole fantasy about moving back there and this renaissance, this exciting mm-hmm. city. And I moved back to Sodom and Gomorrah, which scared the hell out of me. You know? <laughs> I was rehearsing on 45th Street and Broadway. It's not a lot of laughs there, you know? Yeah, a lot of changes. But I've lived here a very long time, and I don't care if I work 15 hours a day and right. work in a motor home. I come home at night, and on the weekends, I see the people I love. And I was yeah. totally disoriented. And I, I went the day after Thanksgiving. So and in the, the four months I was there, I had three days off. Christmas night at 7.30, Tommy and I are sitting in a restaurant alone. New Year's night, you know, eating in the bar of the hotel. And uh, as it turned out, my birthday. And it was terrible. Depressing. Yeah. He got a, a six-foot Christmas tree all decorated, and he put it in the hotel room so I wouldn't feel deprived. And we left it up till we left at the end of February. <laughs> they get a little gamey, don't they? Yes, they get uh, gamey. Needles start falling all over. But, you know, our friends came in at, yeah. at different times. And, I, you know, I'd walk around holding on to Gladys Beagleman's hands for four yeah. days. And then your wife yeah. did the kindest thing that anybody's ever done for me. Opening that, you, I think most of you know from all these years, Madeline Rue, who is an actress, is my oldest friend. And she was not going to be there. And Joanna flew Madeline in for opening night. Nobody told me. And after the show, she just walked into the uh, dressing room. And I dissolved. I mean, I lost control of my body. And I fell down and landed on Madeline's knockers, where you can stay for three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and they just kind of held me up. And Hang gliders have yeah, been yeah, known. You know, God, to, uh, God love her. You know, we didn't need a lot of furniture. Well, you're when emotional, we lived Madeline. My wife, uh, Joanna, will uh, cry as a card trick. Well, you know, and Tommy started to tear up, and then Joanna saw Tommy, so she started to sob. But uh, I, I missed. Yeah. You know, you can't just, at least for me. Right. And I am a very serious actress. Uh, I cannot live my life and my craft. What makes it rich and Ooh, makes it able friends. to give something back is uh, having a life. Yeah, the close. The close friendships, yeah. when it comes right down to, are more important than anything. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't want to live anywhere else for a very long period of time. All right. How about here? We have a cot in the back. You can I'd live love here. I love it. <laughs> I'll stay out on the line, and I'll we'll serve more. We'll be right back after this message. Right. You are the uh, perfect audience tonight for this young man. I'm always happy when you come on and you have a great audience like this, especially if you have a comedian on the show. And uh, he's from Oklahoma, and he appears, uh, son of a gun, yeah. <laughs> he appears regularly as co- host comedian at the Comedy Store in Hollywood, and he'll be there this Friday and Saturday nights when they present the best of the Comedy Store. Would you welcome Argus Hamilton. Argus. Thank you. Great to be back, Johnny. And, uh... This is pretty sophisticated. Uh, I'm, I was born in Poto, Oklahoma, and we're not that hip. <laughs> Our pedestrian lights flash mosey and don't mosey. <laughs> Come up to Hollywood, they flash prance and ponder. <laughs> right? You go out to Malibu, it's lay back and go for it. And of course, in New York, it's kill and hold your fire. <laughs> well, just last September, I was in Yankee Stadium for the first time in my life. And I tell you, it is great to be alive. <laughs> I was there with 71,000 New Yorkers. It was free handgun night. <laughs> and, uh, umpires didn't ball call. <laughs> I was flying home. I was flying home last uh, week. Uh, I got stuck with a $120 Braniff ticket myself. And uh, lucky I paid for it with my Arco credit card. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so I'm stuck here in Hollywood here. Such a friendly place. You don't have neighbors out here in Hollywood. You just have witnesses. <laughs> and such friendly neighbors. Did you see last week where... Uh, Ed Asner accused Charlton Heston of being Reagan's stooge. Now, what an insult to Larry, Moe, and Curly. (laughs) You never saw Heston's Moses go, hey, Pharaoh, (laughs) woo! I 
I see where President Reagan's in town tonight. He's going to be in Beverly Hills speaking at a $12,000 a table dinner. And uh, he's expected to wish all the poor people best of luck. Um, as Amway distributors. And, uh, Okay, you take the minorities. Uh, they're afraid of Reaganomics. What's Reagan gonna do for black unemployment? Expand the NBA to a thousand teams? <laughs> well, you have to feel for him because it's this $110 billion budget deficit that's causing all the problems. And the president knows how much money that is. That's $10 over Nancy's master charge limit. <laughs> and, uh, every 30 days, that's an issue there. So. Uh, but the uh, president wants to balance the budget by putting a tax on gasoline, alcohol, and tobacco. You know, our legitimate drugs. <laughs> if he had put a tax on illegal drugs, he'd balance the budget by Tuesday. <laughs> right? We're talking dividends by Thursday, aren't we, Chris? <laughs> But people keep blowing the money around. And NBC here, they're real excited about their fall lineup. They finally came up with a great show for Eric Estrada. Uh, yeah, this fall, he's going to still play a cop, but he's going to patrol the South Atlantic on a jet ski. They're going to call it Chips Ahoy. It's, a, it's the silliest war I've ever heard of in my life. I mean, it's an 1833 war fought with 1982 weapons. It reminds me of a couple of bald-headed men fighting over a hairbrush, all right? <laughs> yeah, and it's a, a nice match, isn't it? Uh, Britain has three nuclear destroyers, the Invincible, the Hermes, the Intrepid. What's Argentina got? The Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria. <laughs> Only difference is Columbus got over here twice as fast as the British fleet. <laughs> we didn't wait five weeks for the Super Bowl. Let's go, guys. <laughs> but it's good to see people starting to settle down. It's good to see where President Reagan and Brezhnev are finally starting to talk about arms control. And it's a good thing, isn't it? Because I, these old warriors, you know, Reagan and Brezhnev, nothing scares me like an 80-year-old man willing to die for his country. <laughs> young people. We got Porsches to lease and condos to buy. We want to foreclose on somebody. Californians don't even believe the end is near. They just say it's an escrow. <laughs> what did I tell you? <laughs> oh, okay. Did you see in the radio and in the newspapers all day long, they were talking about a nuclear evacuation plan for Southern California. <laughs> the civil defense said that if Russia attacked us right now, We've all got 17 minutes to get out of L.A. <laughs> and go to the desert for safety. 17 minutes. See you on the freeway, folks. <laughs> all right. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know our attitude out here. We need that much time to blow dry. Uh, I mean, to hell with the Russians. We ain't going to Palm Springs looking like this. <laughs> Just back off, Boris, all right? <laughs>the name Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson probably would not be well known to the general public but they have to be included probably among of the most important artists of this generation they went back and worked uh, for Walt Disney in 1934 and 35 became the chief animators at the studio some of the films they worked on include Snow White Cinderella Pinocchio Fantasia Bambi Peter Pan and every feature film that came out of that studio they wrote a, written a book called they writ a book <laughs> <laughs> oh, they've written a book called disney animation the illusion of life and it's a, it's a magnificent book would you welcome please frank thomas and ollie johnson
Please sit down, gentlemen. Have I got Frank here or Ollie here? I'm Frank. You're Frank and you're Ollie. <laughs> you know, you have entertained all of us for so many years, and yet the general public uh, never gets to see the guys behind the scenes. It's we all... liked it that you way. You liked it that way, really? <laughs> yeah. We get the nervous. Little elves in the forest. <laughs> <laughs> this is a way to kind of sublimate your own personalities and have it come out in. When we go to the theater and, uh, with an audience, particularly a kid audience, and watch them, you die. You just yeah. die. You no, know, kids are cruel anyway. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> basically true. It must give you a great thrill, though, to realize that you worked on what I, I guess would be considered almost the official versions of, of fairy tales over the years. They've become that. Uh, yeah, or... I think that a lot of people criticize that and say we've changed them around, but I think yeah. they are the official versions. The now. librarians complain a lot about that. <laughs> yeah. You know, Walt Disney is such a, such a well-known name worldwide, and yet you, you people who didn't know him, and I, I, I did not know him, you hear a lot of conflicting views that he was a cold man, he was hard to work for, uh, all kinds of different things. How, how did you find the man to work for? They're all correct. All, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah he, he was everything you said. Right. I mean, he was a great pleasure to work for. He was very inspiring, but awfully tough. Right. I mean, you'd work your tail off doing something you thought was the greatest thing you'd ever done. Right. And uh, he'd just let it go by and say, now, here's what we're going to do. In other words, to him, it was just expected. Yeah, no, uh, what perfection was expected. To, to have excellent work. How many animators did the height of Disney Studios did they have all together? We had uh, 1,200 working there. At one time, they were not all animators, but right. they were nearly all artists. Yeah, what you call painters and fill-ins and yeah, people who work on... assistants and stylists. And I was going through this book this afternoon. It is absolutely fascinating because those of us who go and watch a cartoon or a full-length feature just kind of take it for granted and don't mm -hmm. see the laborious process of doing figure after figure. How many figures would you say in, in a, say in a cartoon, if even just, you know, eight or ten minutes, how many separate sketches would you have any idea have to be made to just complete that or move to, to make the movement? Well, you can figure it out. There are 24 frames a second. Right. And uh, all you got to do is multiply the number of drawings against the number of frames. And I'm no good at math. So it gets, into, it gets into the hundreds of thousands. Yes. Of, and yeah. a feature picture, uh, we probably do a couple of million drawings. About a half a million would end up on the screen. Right. The rest of them you throw away because they aren't good enough. That's incredible when you talk about a million drawings. Um, is this what you wanted to do when you were both uh, started with Disney? You were both illustrators or animators at that time? You have to, uh, did you have to audition for Disney? Or yeah, what? Yes. And we'd known each other at, uh, up at Stanford University in the right. art department there. I thought I was going to be a landscape painter. That was fun. Right. And uh, Ollie was going to... Uh, Magazine illustrator. Yeah, sports heroes and things like that. And uh, we came down here to art school and uh, heard that Disney was expanding and they wanted looking for artists. Right. So I went out and took the tryout. Now, a tryout, you know what an in-between is? No, you don't know an in-between. No, I don't know. Well, the animator makes... <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Be patient with me here. What's, what's an in-between? <laughs> the animator makes the key drawings. If an arm is going from here to here to right. here. Now, there may be one, two, three drawings in between those two. I there see. may be only, only two in here, depending upon the timing of the thing. So there's well, the animator, and the in-between works on... Yeah. The in-betweener is the bottom of the totem pole. Right. But uh, when you were hired at that time, you had to make your good on production. Right. Now, if you're hired, you get, to, oh boy, you get a month to practice and learn lots of things and study, and right. there's so much to learn now. And the style of animation, if you look at the old original uh, Steamboat Willie from Mickey Mouse, for example, uh, the style of animation uh, has changed over the years. Mm -hmm. Was that just kind of uh, by uh, trial and error? Uh, Walt wanted to re keep refining it and make it more believable. Right. And so that's why it developed that way. The old ones were really charming, I thought. Right. I don't think they'd hold up for a feature length. Right. And the way you can give the human emotions to animals and even human emotions to objects. Yes. Right. Uh, is a challenge, yeah. you know. You ought to have some drawings here, these bottom ones. Showing what you can do with inanimate. Now, this is a, it's just a flower sack. Yeah. Is it not? Mm -hmm. And the idea is, how do you make a flower sack look sad? That's the way you do it. It's a happy flower sack. <laughs> a rejected flower sack. Was in love. In the, what? Macho flower sack. <laughs> Mousy. Nosy. Nosy flower sack. 
<laughs> Eavesdropping. Tickled? <laughs> and tired. <laughs> those are wonderful expressions you can get from just an uh, inanimate object. Yeah, it'd be fun to animate those someday. Yeah, it's incredible. We'll take a quick break. We're coming right back. That's wonderful. It so easy. Gentlemen, I thank you so much. I wish we had longer to talk because uh, I thank you on behalf of all of us for bringing so much pleasure over the years. Thank you. Good night. I'm humbled by that applause.